This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. As many of you know, I'm Nigella Hilgarth, and I'm the executive director of the Birch Aquarium. And this is part of our Perspectives on Ocean Science lectures, the Jeffrey B. Graham lectures. But this is a very special lecture because it's the fourth annual Charles David Keeling Memorial Lecture. And you can tell it's a special lecture because we had artichoke dip, dip to eat and other exciting things. <laughs> Um, but joking apart, um, I'd be looking forward to this evening very much, and we're very lucky to have with us tonight Professor Ralph Keeling, who is Charles David Keeling's son, and he is going to produce our wonderful, uh, introduce our wonderful speaker tonight, Richard Somerville. So thank you. So, so thank you, Nigella, and, and, and thank you all for coming. Uh, as she said, this uh, continues with the fourth annual Charles David Keeling Lecture. That is strange for me to say his name because he is my father. Um, but uh, he had a legacy of uh, CO2 measurements showing that carbon dioxide was rising, putting global warming on the research agenda, uh, and changing the way we think about the world. And I think that legacy will evolve with time as new developments happen. I don't think we know exactly where this lecture series is going to go in the future, but events like Hurricane Sandy remind us that uh, we're in uncharted territory. Uh, the selection of the speaker this year went without geographic prejudice to uh, my close colleague Richard Somerville, uh, a very distinguished uh, colleague within our ranks here at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, he uh, has expertise in uh, theoretical meteorology and in uh, computer simulations of the climate system. As background, he was an undergraduate at Penn State University where he received a BS in meteorology and went on to get a PhD in meteorology at New York University. He's been on the faculty here at Scripps since 1979. Uh, his current title is Distinguished Professor Emeritus and Research Professor. Uh, he's received numerous awards. Uh, he's received awards from the Meteorological Society both for his research and for a popular book he wrote on uh, climate change called The Forgiving Air, Understanding Environmental Change. And a new edition of that book was just published a few years ago in 2008. Uh, among his honors, he's also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Meteorological Society. And uh, I would particularly emphasize a recent accomplishment of his, which was being a coordinating lead author of the uh, 2007 Fourth Assessment Report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This was the report that uh, received the Nobel Prize. Richard played a very large role in that. Being a coordinated lead author meant that he was carrying a lot of weight and a lot of headaches through around for, for a long time. So it's a really a very important and significant accomplishment that really defines our understanding. And it's, it's partly based on that expertise and his broad understanding of the science that um, he has uh, uh, important messages for us. So thank you, Richard, and thank you. Well, thank you, Ralph, for the kind introduction, and uh, thanks to uh, Ralph and his mother, Louise Keeling, and uh, the group for having invited me to I give this talk, and uh, thanks also to uh, Nigella Hilgarth and uh, Cheryl Peach and their colleagues at the Birch Aquarium for making this all happen, and special thanks to you all for, for coming. I uh, knew uh, Charles David Keeling, known to everyone as Dave, uh, for about the last uh, 25 years of his life, 
And he had a very original mind. He was an interesting person as well as a, as a great scientist. And I'm going to uh, take time to tell you a couple of little stories. Dave Keeling wrote a fascinating autobiography about the rewards and penalties for measuring the Earth. And he, he uh, wove in some of his personal history. He said that, that uh, I'm quoting now, during the Great Depression, my father, although personally successful, became distressed about the economic future of our nation. And in the late 1930s, he quit his work in order to study, teach, and preach banking reform, thereby plunging our family into the poverty he was distressed about. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, Dave had a winning way with words. He wrote, went on to say, I was exposed so extensively to my father's ideas in economics and banking that I abandoned a curriculum in chemistry at the University of Illinois simply to avoid taking a required course in economics. <laughs> I felt quite passionately that my exposure to economics at home had been enough. Uh, Dave Keeling did do a PhD in, in chemistry at Northwestern and a, a postdoctoral fellowship at Caltech. And that's where he began measuring atmospheric carbon dioxide using an instrument of his own design. And he, uh, he made tests um, and learned a lot as a postdoc. He went outdoors to a state park in Northern California to find unpolluted air, not available in Pasadena. And, <laughs> He wrote, not being sure that the CO2, even in pristine air next to the Pacific Ocean, would be constant, I decided to take air samples every few hours over a full day and night. Why did I devise such an elaborate sampling strategy when my experiment didn't really require it? The reason was simply that I was having fun. <laughs> I liked designing and assembling equipment. And at the age of 27, he wrote the prospect of uh, spending a lot more time at Big Sur State Park didn't seem objectionable at all. Dave Keeling was encouraged by Harry Wexler in charge of research at the Weather Bureau and by Roger Revelle, who was then director of Scripps. And he moved to Scripps in 1956 and stayed here uh, for the rest of his uh, career. And the famous Mauna Loa uh, CO2 record uh, began in 1958. This is a rather characteristic uh, pose of, uh, of Dave Keeling in front of, in front of Scripps' uh, pier. And now I want to say a little bit um, about the CO2 record which is so central. It's something that's uh, always present, either tacitly or explicitly, in every discussion about man-made climate ch change. This slide here shows on the right the observatory in, in Mauna Loa. Uh, this was uh, intended to uh, be part of the International Geophysical Year, an 18-month uh, period. And at the lower left, you see the first um, decade and a half or so of uh, Keeling's measurements, which began in, in 1958. And what you're looking at is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Concentration is the jargon term, and it's expressed in parts per million by volume, which is equivalent to the number of molecules per million molecules. So it's a rare gas. The atmosphere is almost all nitrogen and oxygen. But you see here that out of a million molecules of air in 1958, about 314 of them would be carbon dioxide uh, molecules. And you see uh, the, the graph there at the lower left uh, tracing the first few years. So you can see a lot of things on this graph just right away. First of all, there, it's increasing with time. So Keeling was the first to measure atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration accurately. And he was the first to discover that it was increasing in the atmosphere. Uh, there were previous attempts at measurement, but none of them uh, had the accuracy that that he had. He also discovered this uh, annual oscillation, and that's due uh, to plants in photosynthesizing in the spring and drawing down the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and converting it to plant material. And then in the fall, uh, or at the cold part of the year, the leaves fall off, the plants respire, and CO2 is returned uh, to the atmosphere. He discovered all these things, and he also discovered that the rise in carbon dioxide was due to human activities, and in particular to burning fossil fuels. So we owe him uh, all that, and uh, that was uh, apparent early on, in the early 1960s, but the, uh, he continued these, uh, uh, these measurements, uh, often uh, with great struggles to find uh, appropriate funding. And here's what the Keeling Curve, which is the popular name for this, looks like today, or actually looked like in December, which was the last time I, 
uh, downloaded it. It's being frequently updated. And you can see that what was 314 then is now 395 or so, pushing 400 uh, today. That's a remarkable uh, story uh, right there, because that increase is something like 25%. Uh, Keeling's measurements were very accurate. Um, he uh, said that he built the instrument um, to a greater accuracy than he thought it needed to be, just because he, he figured out how. And the rate of increase uh, has been going up. You can even see by eye that the upward slope of the curve in the early years is uh, uh, less strong than the slope, in, the slope in recent years. So Keeling made the discovery, we owe it entirely to him, that mankind is changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere in important ways. And the greenhouse effect had been understood for a long time. The fact that carbon dioxide and other molecules uh, trap infrared energy, they trap heat essentially, had been known to experimental physicists in the middle 1800s. John Tyndall in London put carbon dioxide in a tube and uh, measured how it could absorb infrared energy, which he, he could shine on it. And uh, the first attempts to, to understand the implications of this for climate date back uh, to the uh, 1890s. So in a sense, the science was there uh, s connecting carbon dioxide amounts in the atmosphere to climate change until we had the measurement showing that the CO2 was actually increasing, and increasing much more quickly than had been foreseen in the 19th century. There were more people using more coal and oil and natural gas, and the uh, rapidity of the growth of CO2 was a surprise uh, to everyone. But it was Dave Keeling's measurements who showed this unambiguously. And these measurements are being continued today by his son Ralph and by others elsewhere. And uh, they are the bedrock uh, data, observational data, on which our understanding of man-made uh, climate change rests. I have one more little Keeling story to show you. This is the Great Hall of the National Academy of Sciences in Washington. Uh, election to that was one of Dave's many, many honors. And here's the Keeling curve, at least as it was in about 2002, up there with some of the, uh, uh, the uh, iconic achievements of modern science, such as Darwin's finches or the uh, double helix of, uh, of DNA. So uh, the world now recognizes the importance of the work uh, that he did. OK, I'm going to show you some more data now. This is the temperature, average temperature of the surface of the Earth from 1850 on the left to 2010 on the right. And uh, there's several things that can be said about this. You're looking at compilations of this data by two centers. The purple one is in England. The blue one is in the United States. The dots connected by straight lines are the uh, yearly numbers, the annual average temperature of the surface of the Earth, the atmosphere near the surface, uh, averaged over a year. And these purple and blue curves are the smooth uh, connection, smoothing out the interannual wiggles, which are largely due to natural fluctuations, including especially El Nino and La Nina, and also uh, volcanism, for example. Uh, it must be said that in the 1800s, in the left side of the curve, the data was not as good as today. There weren't as many temperatures, there weren't as many thermometers, the, they weren't as calibrated together as well, there weren't any satellites, and so on. The, as time goes on, these uh, errors get smaller and smaller. In recent years, as you can see, the uh, compilations fall uh, essentially on top of one another. And there are several centers, in addition to these two, that keep track of this. The data all agree they've been carefully quality controlled and uh, uh, sensible assumptions have been made about missing data or poorly cited data and so on. So that we know now that the world is unamb unambiguously warming. It was, uh, looks like it was warming also in the early part of the 20th century. And then there's a period from roughly 1940 into the late 1970s where the temperature cooled slightly, didn't uh, change much. It's still a bit of a mystery. We're not sure about that. The most popular and probable explanation is that in this period here, there was more pollution in the air. The, the Clean Air Act in the US and comparable laws in other countries hadn't been passed. And uh, so that the pollution particles in part reflected away sunlight and temporarily masked uh, the warming due to the increasing amounts of carbon dioxide. There's a very rapid warming uh, since then at about 2 tenths of a degree Celsius per decade or a third of a degree Fahrenheit per decade and it's continuing uh, uh, today. And there's uh, very little doubt that it's human caused, and I can uh, uh, talk later about the reasons that we know this, but essentially, the alternative explanations can be ruled out quantitatively. 
We know what causes ice ages to come and go. For example, it's changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun, which affect how sunlight is distributed with seasons and, and with geography. And that's just too weak and too slow to be responsible for something uh, happening this quickly, a few decades. That, that works on timescales of thousands and tens of thousands of years. Similarly, we can measure the amount of radiation that the sun emits. And that changes very slightly, too, about a tenth of a percent over the 11-year solar cycle. And when you convert that into the same numbers, it just doesn't compare with the effects of, of CO2. Also, when we measure how the warming is distributed with space and with altitude in the atmosphere, uh, it doesn't fit other, uh, other possible mechanisms. So a lot of uh, good, clean scientific detective work. There's a whole topic in climate science called detection and attribution, to detect uh, unnatural uh, climate fluctuations and then to attribute them to specific causes. And uh, there's very little doubt uh, in the expert community now that the bulk of the warming observed in, in recent decades is uh, uh, with high probability due to human activities. That's something that's accepted by mainstream uh, climate science. Besides temperatures, there are lots of other things we can point to. You know, there is, as you may know, a dark side, a dis disinformation campaign, very bad but well-funded and clever people, who would like you to believe that modern climate science is controversial and not well-funded and hangs from some slender thread of evidence so that if a particular data point uh, is shown to be mistaken or then the whole edifice collapses like a house of cards. But in fact, there's not a slender thread. There's a big, thick rope woven of many chains of evidence. And here are 10 indicators that the climate is, is warming. Some of them are obvious. We've talked about temperature over land and temperature over the oceans. The oceans uh, is warming. The sea surface temperature is warming. The great majority of the heat that's been absorbed uh, in the climate system in recent decades is in the ocean. Something like 90% of it is in the ocean. Sea level is rising. White arrows here mean the, the measurement is going up. Black arrows mean it's going down. Sea level is rising for several reasons. One is that the ocean expands thermally, like many things. It takes up more volume as it gets warmer. But another is that ice on land melts and the liquid water eventually flows into the sea. We know also that sea level is rising now because Greenland and Antarctica are losing mass. Their ice sheets are contributing to sea level rise. Glaciers are in retreat worldwide. Snow cover is retreating. I'm going to talk more about sea ice in a moment. Water vapor is more plentiful in the atmosphere. The atmosphere today has more water vapor in it than it did, say, 30 years ago. That's not a conjecture. We can measure that. But it's also expected because the, a warm air holds more water vapor, so to speak, than, uh, than cold air. For, for you physicists here, the saturation vapor pressure uh, is a strong monotonic increasing function of temperature. So there is more water vapor, and that has many ramifications. Most of the kinetic energy, the energy of motion of the atmosphere, can be traced to its source in phase changes of water between liquid gas and solid. And the water also contributes uh, to more rainfall. The rainfall is falling more often in heavy deluges uh, than in drizzles, you might say. And it has implications uh, for the strengths of tropical cyclones, which I'm going to come to uh, in a bit. So there are many, many independent, independent uh, uh, <coughs> measurements that let us conclude with, uh, with, strong, uh, with essentially uh, no uncertainty. Unequivocal was the IPCC's phrase. Uh, that we're living in a warming world. I want to say something about sea ice I just promised you. And what you're seeing here is the average sea ice uh, at the September minimum. Arctic sea ice, we're in the Arctic here, is a minimum in September. The summer melt season is ending. The winter ice forming season is just beginning. So if you look around the year at the time when the, the sea ice extent, the aerial extent of ice in the Arctic, is, greater, is, miss, is least at September. And this yellow period here shows this uh, period of 17 or 18 years, uh, starting with the beginning of the satellite era. We couldn't observe this well from space before 1979. Uh, we see the average extent. In 2007, there was a striking reduction in the sea ice extent that was, had, had been unforecast. And 2007 happens to be the year that the most recent IPCC report came out. IPCC, the Intergovernmental for Panel for Climate Change, and agency under UN auspices which organizes scientists to uh, write these thousand page summaries of the state of climate science produces one of these reports every six years or so. There's one in progress now. It'll come out starting this, in this September. And this report came out in, uh, in February of 2007. In September, uh, the forecast of how sea ice would re be reduced was shown to be wrong. It was much less. And it continues to be reduced year after year and the, now the all-time low extent of Arctic sea ice occurred this past September 
And I've got a movie here, which if it works, I will show that. So you, have to, you can watch the sea ice in kind of time lapse going from 1979 to the present. So here, the year's 1980s. You can see it's different every year. It's not the same. It depends on winds and currents and lots of other things. And uh, in the 1990s, it still looks about that. But now we're uh, about to enter the current century. Here's 2000. And watch 2007. It's suddenly very small. And now watch 2012. It's smaller still. And if you look at this numerically, it's quite striking. I've got a graph here to show you. These graphs are all from the IPCC report last time, 2007, a report written by a number of scientists in 2009 called the Copenhagen Diagnosis to brief the UN climate negotiators, and a new national climate assessment now out in draft form for comment being produced by the US um, government. I'm a co-author of all of those things, so I'm not entirely um, out of bounds in showing you them. But so here is the Arctic sea ice in 2012 compared to what it was in two representative earlier years. You can see that it's far less. And if you graph the amount starting in 1979 when satellite measurements began, if you graph the amount here, you're looking at millions of square miles here. This is 3 million square miles or so at the beginning part of the record. This is the 2007 surprise uh, minimum amount. And this is the 2012 minimum amount, less than one and a half. So the, the ex extent of the area covered by sea ice in the Arctic uh, has dramatically been reduced by about a factor of two. That's a, about 50%, if you like. It was three in round numbers here and one and a half now. Now, mind you, at the same time, the thickness of the ice has also been diminishing. The, the, the ice in the Arctic now is thinner than it used to be, thus more vulnerable to melting. But the volume of the ice, essentially the product of the thickness and the aerial extent, shown here, is thus being reduced more rapidly than the aerial extent altogether. So the ice is, in fact, disappearing. There are various estimates about when it will be all gone. The comment that I like best comes from the US Navy, which <laughs> has uh, said, we will have one more ocean to patrol. <laughs> and uh, so many, many consequences flow from that, of course. Shipping, danger of oil spills, extraction of minerals there, national boundary uh, <coughs> controversies, and so on. But there is an example where the climate is changing more rapidly and more severely than had been foreseen uh, by any model. And in defense of the scientists, this isn't easy to, uh, to model or to forecast. It's not just a question of the ice melts when the sea gets colder than 32 Fahrenheit, because it's a question of when do the ice, when do the winds and the ocean currents move the ice to parts of the Arctic that are more vulnerable to melting. Here's another uh, variable in the climate system that has been changing more rapidly than than had been foreseen. What you're looking at here is sea level, the global average sea level, changes in centimeter. Two and a half centimeters is an inch. And uh, shown from 1970 on the left to near the present on the right, the red line here are sea level measurements from tide gauges. Tide gauges are essentially floats in tubes at shorelines. There's one on, at the Scripps Pier just down the hill from here. And then here are satellite observations. The tide gauges have been supplanted in large measure by satellite altimetry. Instruments can measure the distance from the satellite to the ocean, and uh, that gives you global coverage too. You can see that where the two are shown here, they lie on top of one another. And uh, what you may be able to see is that there's a gray area here called IPCC predictions, and the, the sea level is rising near the top of, uh, of that range. So sea level is running near the worst uh, case. This is a graph updated to 2010 from a paper published in Science in 2007 that I was a co-author on, and we concluded that uh, comparing the predictions of earlier IPCC reports, the fourth one just came out in 2007, there were three before that over the preceding 20 years or so, it, it must be said that the IPCC uh, assessments have not exaggerated climate change, and in some cases such as sea level seem to have underestimated it. We don't know yet uh, what the new IPCC report will say, although it's been out in draft form for review comments, but I'm confident that it will have a higher upper limit on what sea level might be. And many projections have uh, ranged up to uh, two meters, roughly six feet, uh, by 2100, a very serious level. This is global average. Sea level at a location can be more or less because the land can be uh, rising or falling. 
But it must be said also that this is an area where there's a lot of research that still needs to be done. And there's more than one way to model sea level rise. And different kinds of models, different scientific approaches don't yet converge. And so this is an area of active research. And we don't know. But we can't rule out uh, sea level rise um, in excess of three or four feet, uh, whereas the IPCC report predicted up to two feet in the last report that came out. Now, on this graph is temperature and carbon dioxide. And let's look at the black line first. That's carbon dioxide, 1880 on the left, the present on the right. So starting in 1958, these are Keeling's measurements, smoothed out to, to uh, remove that annual modulation I talked about. So where do these data come from when Keeling wasn't uh, busy doing this? And the answer is, that's a remarkable story. That's a story that's a reflection of some very clever scientific detective work and some amazing good luck. And the good luck is that there are two places on Earth where air from previous times, reaching back into the geological history, is available today. And that's Greenland and Antarctica. And it's present in the ice. When ice forms in Greenland and Antarctica, the ice forms because the weight of new snowfall compresses the snow under it from previous years and eventually turns it to ice. And trapped in the ice are tiny bubbles of air, if you like fossil air, air preserved from that time. And the technology now is so good that we can go to Greenland and Antarctica, drill, bring up cores of ice, date it, take the ice to the laboratory, and uh, measure the amount of carbon dioxide in these tiny uh, bubbles. And so we know that it was rising gradually before Keeling's measurements began, and that in the times be before the 1800s, uh, when human activities presumably had no strong effect on climate, it uh, was near a value of 280 in these same units of molecules per million molecules. So CO2 has been rising. And the lines here are, each bar is one year, is the average surface temperature, the same measurements you saw earlier. And you can see there's a lot of variability. The average temperature is in Fahrenheit degrees, so the average temperature over this period was about 57.6 Fahrenheit globally, surface temperature day and night, summer and winter. But uh, in all the years before uh, the 1930s, you might say, every year was below that average. And in recent years, every year has been above it. And in between, as a, the period I mentioned, 1940 to 1970, when there wasn't much change, maybe a slight cooling on, on the whole, there were both above average and below average years. Again, the natural variability is due to factors like El Nino and the occasional strong volcano, which temporarily cools the climate for a year or two. And uh, so these things here are some of the strongest El Ninos uh, on record. But that there's a warming now and that this is period is different from this period isn't any doubt at all. This is that same uh, temperature variation now shown as maps from uh, here you are in the early 1900s till today. Blue is cooler than average and yellow and orange are warmer than average. And you can see here it's still uh, some blue areas and so on. But starting in the 1970s, uh, you start to see the yellow and orange colors predominating. And uh, by the time this uh, ends, uh, 2010 or so, you can see what the world looks like today uh, in this picture. There's warming everywhere. There's more warming over the continents than over the oceans. There's more warming in the north than in the south. And there's the strongest warming in the Arctic. This is a Mercator projection, so it exaggerates the area of the Arctic. But the warming is strongest in high northern latitudes. And that's because of a number of feedbacks that we think we understand, of which the most important is that when warming occurs in the far north, the ice and snow melt, as we've seen. And the ice and snow having melted reveal darker water and darker land that was under them, which reflect less sunlight and therefore absorb more sunlight. So the chain of events is carbon dioxide causes the warming. The warming <coughs> melts snow and ice. The melted snow and ice make the surface darker. The darker surface absorbs more sunlight, and that adds to the warming. It's a, a vicious circle, as though you had your house wired funny, and when it got hot, it turned on the furnace instead of the air conditioner. If you want to take home one slide from what I have to say, I highly recommend this slide, and I'd like to walk you uh, through it. What's shown here as a function of time from 2005 on the left to mid-century on the right is the rate at which we're emitting uh, carbon dioxide, gigatons, which is geek speak for billions of metric tons of carbon dioxide, 
which is a lot, you see. We're putting upwards of 30 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Again, mainly from burning coal and oil and natural gas, but secondarily from deforestation, cement manufacture, and another, another number of sources. And you can see that it's been going up in recent years. In fact, it's been going up continually for many years. There was a kind of one-year blip uh, due to the Great Recession, but it's resumed going up again. Uh, driven now largely by rapid industrialization in developing countries with large populations, such as India and China, that are exploiting coal energetically. The three curves here represent three possible scenarios. This was from the Copenhagen Diagnosis, which came out at the end of 2009. And, the, and so the dates here are chosen so that we could say, if you pick 2011 as the year when you would turn things around, and mankind would stop raising its emissions every year and start reducing them, then uh, this green line here is a scenario in which the emissions are reduced gradually so that by mid-century uh, ha they haven't gone to zero. The blue curve is one in which emissions keep growing for another four years and then start being reduced and reach zero before mid-century. And the red curve is one in which emissions continue growing throughout the present decade and then decrease very rapidly, reaching zero by 2040. And what these three curves have in common is that the area under them is about the same. And it's the area under them that represents the total cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide during this period. And because carbon dioxide lasts in the atmosphere a long time, it's proportional to the total amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is what matters to the climate. Climate just reacts to how many of what kinds of heat trapping gases are there. The more there are of an important gas like CO2, which is by far the most important man-made gas, uh, the warmer it gets. So what these curves have in common is that the area under them represents the amount of CO2 such that you'd have a two out of three chance of limiting global warming to two degrees Celsius, which is 3.6 Fahrenheit, above what it was in the 1800s. This is done in response to what some governments have des decided. The European Union, for example, which is Western Europe, which has more people and a larger GDP than the United States, has formally decided as an official policy position that it will uh, try to limit global warming to 2 degrees Celsius, or 3.6 Fahrenheit in our units. Why? It's a judgment call. It's not a scientific decision. It's a little bit like your cholesterol, you know, that your doctor can't assure you that if your cholesterol is below a certain number, you can't have a heart attack. And if it's above that number, you're sure to have a heart attack. It's just that the risk goes up. And so this is a measure, you might say, of how much risk you're willing to accept. And it's also a measure of economic priorities and a number of other things. But the European Union, after careful consideration, has said two degrees Celsius is a, a target that they'd like to strive for. A number of other countries have signed on to this informally as an aspirational goal. Some countries, especially low-lying island states, have said, we'd like to have less uh, than, than that much uh, warming. But if you want to have that much warming, if you, the governments of the world, take that decision, then the science can help you say what it would take to, to get it. And what it says is there's a certain amount of CO2 that you can have in the atmosphere and no more. We don't know exactly. That's why this is a two out of three chance. But it says that if that's your goal, it's better to start reducing emissions right away because then you can glide down with reductions of three or four percent per year. If you wait until 2015 before you reduce them, then to meet this goal, you have to decrease them by about five percent per year. And if you are going to procrastinate and dither, as the world has done until 2020, then you must reduce them by this uh, rate here, which economists will tell you is essentially uh, difficult or impossible to do. Um, I didn't draw this graph. It came from a number of German scientists, it's, uh, but I named it. I called it the ski slope diagram. This is the bunny slope here, and this is the intermediate ski slope, and this red line is the double black diamond expert <laughs> slope. So that's where the urgency in my title comes from. It says this is, is not an issue like uh, steel tariffs, you might say, or trade agreements that you can Think about getting it done next decade if you can't get it done this decade. This is something that Mother Nature puts a time limit on. There's only so much CO2 you can tolerate in the atmosphere. And in this range, the climate change is just proportional to that amount of CO2. So that if you're serious about a target like two degrees warming, this is what you're faced with. You can't 
think about decreasing things in 50 or 100 years, you have to do it in five or 10 years. And that's the urgency. And it's in that sense that this urgency has nothing to do with politics or ideology, it's just science saying in a straightforward way that the physics and biogeochemistry of the climate system say that it's urgent to do that. It has to, have to start happening in a few years. Alternatively, if you don't do anything, then you're not going to make that target. And you're going to have to cope with, with more climate change. It's been said that we're either going to mitigate climate change, that is, do this kind of thing to reduce it, or we're going to adapt to a changed climate, or we're going to suffer. And what we get to choose is how much of mitigating and adapting and suffering we get to do. So that's the take-home message of, of what I have to say. But not the last slide. <laughs> you know, these uh, temperature numbers are a little bit like a fever in your health. A higher fever is a more severe disease, but they don't tell you what all the aspects of climate that matter to people and to ecosystems are, because it's a lot more than just temperature. It has to do with droughts and heat waves and sea level rises and threats of stronger hurricanes. And I want to say a bit about those things now. So what you're looking at here is two maps of the world, uh, two future scenarios. Uh, the one on the left, a low pathway, uh, something like the bunny slope on the, the previous diagram. And the one on the right, a high pathway, and essentially business as usual. And it illustrates that uh, the fact of the matter is that the future climate, the one that our children and grandchildren will deal with, is in our hands. We get to choose, and we will saddle them with this if we continue uh, increasing in population, increasing in prosperity, increasing energy use, energy primarily generated by fossil fuel use, which is upwards of 80% of global energy use today. And this is uh, the opposite. This says take steps uh, to uh, uh, switch away from fossil fuels and to do all the other things you can do to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide uh, going in. You can see the scale down here. These dark reds uh, uh, have to do with temperature rises in Fahrenheit of uh, 9 to 15 degrees, whereas this yellow and orange has to do with uh, 3 to 5 or 7 uh, degrees at most. So it's a very different world. This is the same kind of chart uh, for the United States. And you're looking here. Uh, keep in mind that the U.S. average temperature has already increased by a degree and a half Fahrenheit since 1895, and more than 80% of that has been in the 32 years since 1980. So this says that by 2100, uh, on high emissions, you can expect uh, 5 to 10 degree increases in much of the country, uh, more in northern Alaska for the reasons I mentioned, whereas on low emissions, uh, you can restrict that. And I think now what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about one particularly dramatic kind of consequence of climate change, which is changes in extreme weather. There is no doubt uh, that uh, the changes I've described uh, express themselves often through changes in extreme weather. So that we know, for example, in the US right now, that the number of new high temperature records being broken every year far exceeds the number of new low temperature records being broken. If the climate weren't changing, you'd expect just by random chance there'd be about as many new highs as new lows we're breaking more highs. We're also seeing more rain uh, falling in deluges, in gully washers, you might say, uh, than in drizzles or, or light rain events. And we're beginning to see uh, changes in, uh, in heat waves. We're beginning to see changes in droughts. Happened last year in this country. The heat wave in 2010 in Russia was an example. The heat wave in 2003 in Western Europe that killed 35,000 people, and chiefly in France, uh, is likely to have been exacerbated by climate change. You have to keep in mind that weather today is taking place in an environment, on a stage you might say, that has been altered by climate change. Temperatures are higher, sea surface temperatures are up, water vapor content of the atmosphere is up, and so on. I'm going to uh, say a bit more about that, but first I wanted to show you a film of Hurricane Sandy from last fall. This is a satellite loop, and uh, while it's uh, playing, you can see Hurricane Sandy at the lower right forming in the in the Caribbean, I'll remind you of a few facts about this storm. It was a late season, late October, um, post-tropical cyclone. It swept through the Caribbean and up the east coast of the United States in October of 2012. It left many dead, thousands homeless, millions without power. The total damage, and according to most recent estimates, is at least $75 billion, with a B, it's the second costliest Atlantic hurricane behind only Hurricane Katrina 
which hit New Orleans in 2005. The death toll from Sandy was at least 285. It famously was a hybrid storm. This tropical cyclone moved into the extratropics and merged with this mid-latitude uh, cyclonic weather system uh, to create a hybrid storm, something that we're only just beginning to study and understand. Sandy made landfall in the U.S. on October 29th. Up here are the dates. 2012 is the year. 10 is October. 26 is the date. Uh, on October 29th, near Atlantic City, New Jersey, with winds of 80 miles per hour. Through bad luck, a full moon made uh, high tides about 20% higher than normal and amplified the storm surge. That is, the uh, ocean water brought ashore by the storm, which also amplified by the, the rising sea level. Uh, as you may recall, seawater surged over lower Manhattan seawalls and highways and into streets. The water inundated tunnels, subway stations, and the electrical system that powers Wall Street. The hurricane force winds of uh, at least 74 miles an hour at this landfall point uh, extended up to 175 miles in radius, and uh, tropical storm force winds extended out to 485 miles in radius. So Sandy at its peak covered the northeastern part of the United States, affected 24 out of the 48 states, and was essentially 1,000 miles across at about this point here. Uh, Sandy's uh, strength and angle of approach combined to produce a record storm surge of water into New York City in Battery Park, that's the lower tip of Manhattan. Uh, the storm surge uh, topped 13.9 feet, uh, surpassing the previous record of 10 feet in Hurricane Donna in 1960. And the surf re reached a record level in New York Harbor when a buoy measured a 32 and a half foot wave, which was also taller uh, than the tallest, far taller than the tallest wave uh, uh, seen up till then. I'm going to show you a little bit to remind you of Sandy's uh, damage, uh, but this is a, an extraordinary uh, satellite loop. And I thought before I, I showed you the damage, I wanted to say a little bit, because uh, I don't want to close without mentioning that a number of popular myths, uh, things that are widely repeated and aren't true, uh, that are part of the disinformation campaign uh, that uh, <coughs> Uh, is attempting to create confusion among politicians and people in the media as to what climate science uh, can and cannot do. So here's a popular myth. What you're looking at here is the average temperature of the world in, uh, from 1970 till 2010. And there's been a warming here. As you can see, this is in Fahrenheit degrees. So there's been a warming of, uh, since this is zero, and it starts above one, of of roughly a third of a degree Fahrenheit per decade, or <coughs> about a, a degree and a third over four decades, shown by this red line. When you hear people say global warming has stopped since 1998, or global warming doesn't happen anymore, what they're invariably doing is cherry picking these data uh, so that if you pick five uh, year periods, you can get either slightly falling, sharply rising, sharply falling, sharply rising, and here is 1998, a strong El Nino. And so you can say, well, in this period here, the temperature has leveled off, although in these last two years, it's higher than, than 1998. El Ninos bring heat out of the ocean temporarily and put it in the atmosphere. So El Ninos are spikes and La Ninas are these uh, troughs. But the real fact is that you need a couple of decades, 17 years or more, to create a meaningful long-term trend for this particular variable of global average temperature. And uh, short trends don't mean anything, and they're dominated by this uh, natural variability, uh, El Ninos, volcanoes, and so on. Whereas the long-term trend is quite unambiguous. And if you look at the same data a different way, you can, uh, you can bin it in decades and say that the 1980s were the warmest decade on record at the time, warmer than anything before. But the 1990s were even warmer, and every year in the 1990s was above the average for the 1980s, and every year in the 2000s was warmer than the 1990s average. So the fact that the world is warming is quite unambiguous, and uh, it's laughable to say that it has stopped or paused or is no longer discernible or anything else masked. Or it's just warming. That's just a fact. So there's, uh, it's just a good example of how to lie with statistics. And at the end, I'll give you a website that refutes a number of these myths. I've never met anybody who says that they believe them, but they always have somebody named Uncle Joe who comes to the party and, and uh, spouts this nonsense, and they want to know how to refute Uncle Joe. So I'm going to give you the quick uh, Cliff Notes crib sheet for that. I'm going to leave the screen dark for a second while I say something about the question of did global warming cause 
Hurricane Sandy, which I'm asked about twice a day, every day. <laughs> and the best answer that we know is to say courteously, that's the wrong question. Because the metaphor we like to use is that carbon dioxide is the steroids of the climate system. You don't see its effect in one weather event. You see it in the statistics. When the baseball slugger was clean, he still hit home runs. So when you go to the ballpark later, after he's been on steroids and he hits a home run, you can't say whether that home run was due to the steroids. He was a powerful major league slugger before. But what you can see is at the end of the season in the statistics, his batting average has gone up, his home run productivity has gone up, his slugging percentage has gone up. And climate is the statistics of weather. So just as Hurricane Sandy is operating in an environment that's been altered by climate change in such a way that we expect stronger hurricanes, and we see statistically greater uh, instances of strongest hurricanes in the North Atlantic Basin where we have the most data, but in the rest of the world where almost all the hurricanes are, we don't have the data to show it yet. There's a lot of year-to-year -year variability, but we still can say that on average we would expect to see the odds change in favor of stronger storms. So it's tricky, and you can't say uh, that, that climate change did or did not cause a particular event, but you see it in the statistics of the ball player, and the statistics of weather is climate. Okay, I wanted to, in closing, uh, say some optimistic things, but I did want to make the point that extreme weather is an aspect of climate. This is an example of things that might be done, and if, if you go through this list here, it's a familiar list. The low-hanging fruit is energy efficiency and energy conservation that often comes at small or even negative costs, but there are many things that can be done, and I'm not going to go through them all. It's a list that I think you know, but all the careful analyses show that taken together they can do a lot. There's no single silver bullet, but there's a lot of silver buckshot. And so there's a lot of different things you can do, and these wedges in the jargon of the trade are examples of them. So it's possible to do it. It's really a question of uh, political will. The technology is there, and there are already good examples of countries and U.S. states that have vastly increased their electricity generation from renewables, for example. We know that it's possible to vastly improve ve vehicle fuel uh, mileage and so on. But the message to take home here, again, is that this is urgent. People have to raise this to a higher profile. Everybody's in, in favor of uh, leaving an undamaged planet to their children, but it's not number one or number two priority. It doesn't rank uh, with health care and education and, and a strong economy. But the fact is that, as you saw, a window of opportunity is open. It's still open. It's been open for a long time. We haven't taken advantage of it, but it will close. Remember, there's a sort of decadal time scale in which the world has to do something serious about reducing global emissions in order to meet this moderate target of, of uh, 3.6 Fahrenheit warming. And once that window closes, it will stay closed. Uh, this is a special moment in my life. Last year, the Dalai Lama spent a day at UCSD, and my Scripps colleague, Virabhadran Ramanathan, and I uh, spent a morning in RIMAC uh, on the main campus uh, in conversation with him about climate change, which he understands and, and takes uh, seriously. And experts in communication and in persuasion and in the, in the subject of how to change people's minds say we need three things. One, we need simple messages. Two, we need those simple messages repeated often. And three, we need those simple messages repeated often by a variety of trusted messengers. And I think among those trusted messengers, people like the Dalai Lama, you don't have to be a Tibetan Buddhist to understand how revered and respected this man is worldwide. And you don't have to study a lot of history to realize what uh, people of, of comparable stature think of Martin Luther King or Gandhi or Nelson Mandela have been able to accomplish. And I think that it's very important that in future, one critical way of raising public consciousness and raising uh, this on the politicians' uh, uh, priority list is to enlist the help of uh, trusted messengers. That's almost all I wanted to say. I just wanted to, uh, to say that what science has here, the role of science, I think, in this 
issue is to inform the public, to inform policymakers. The IPCC reports, which are just assessments of the current research literature, uh, rendered in a way that's palatable and intelligible to, and relevant to policymakers, but without being policy prescriptive, are an example of that. And the urgency here, I stress, is not uh, political. It's just that to say that if governments will decide that a moderate degree of, of climate change is tolerable, then the urgency uh, isn't ideological or political. It's uh, fact and evidence based. It comes from science and it's firmly based on the physics and chemistry of the climate system. I'm going to leave this last slide up during the question period. Uh, these are some of the websites that I recommend. Uh, my site at the top, for example, has a link to the entire uh, conversation with the Dalai Lama, which is very moving. Climate Communication <coughs> is a site run by my partner, Susan Hassel, uh, with whom I've done a lot of joint work on climate outreach and messaging. She's a, a communication um, expert, and there's a lot of good links and downloads on both of our sites. Real Climate is a blog uh, for geeks. I look at it every day. It's run by some good climate scientists, and I recommend that you trust the main postings by the people who run the site and take with a grain of salt the comments by uh, bloggers, uh, which vary all over the map. Skeptical Science is the site I promised you. It's run by an Australian scientist named John Cook, who has uh, compiled many, many refutations <coughs> at, at various educational levels, you might say, to the common myths um, that are the armament of the disinformation campaign, including uh, myths like it's all due to the sun, it's natural variability, it was, uh, <coughs> there were alligators in the North Pole, and blah, blah, blah. And IPCC, uh, that CH at the bottom is the French abbreviation for Switzerland. IPCC has an office in Geneva. That's the site where the Intergovernmental for Panel for Climate Change reports are available and downloaded. They're heavy going, but we use them as textbooks for graduate students here, and I highly recommend them to you. You've been very kind. I'll take questions now. Thank you very much. And the question, if I may paraphrase what you said, was what happened to the ozone hole? We used to hear a lot about it, and we don't hear much about it now. And that's a success story. Uh, the ozone hole was discovered in the early 1980s. It a, was a sudden disappearance over Antarctica of a large uh, fraction of the ozone in the lower stratosphere in the Antarctic Spring. And uh, we found out through a lot of very good science being done rapidly, plus um, a nice situation where the political world, the industrial world, and uh, <coughs> the science got together. What happened was the culprits that destroyed stratospheric ozone was man-made chemicals. Chlorofluorocarbons used in refrigeration and other uses. Freon is a popular trade name. They used to be in your car air conditioner. And uh, DuPont and the other big chemical companies that made money uh, on Freons succeeded in um, making ozone benign substitutes. And uh, laws were passed. The Montreal Protocol was the first one. There were many following laws that outlawed uh, the production of these chemicals and required ozone safe substitutes for them. And all of that happened. Uh, there were international conferences, technology and money changed hands, uh, different countries contributed in different ways. But as far as we know now, the ozone hole is on the way to healing. And uh, we expect that sometime around mid-century, uh, it will look something like what it looked before we tampered with it. So it's a great success story. Um, and uh, a lot of people deserve credit. Science was certainly a big, a big part of it. And it's often held up as a paradigm on, for what needs to be done about global warming. I think the big difference is it was much easier to do in retrospect, that the chlorofluorocarbons uh, were, and related chemical compounds were a niche chemical used in re refrigeration, air conditioning, certain industrial processes. Whereas now we're talking about uh, coal and oil and natural gas, which are a, a monstrous global uh, industry supplying upwards of 80% of the world's energy. It's not going to be anywhere near as easy to change that around. And the question was that I've been talking about CO2, whereas water vapor is in fact also in the atmosphere and it's a more powerful uh, gas. It's responsible for a stronger um, <coughs> greenhouse effect, a stronger heat trapping effect uh, than CO2. And uh, how about that and what are there important effects of agriculture, if, I've, if I paraphrase you correctly, where we've put large amounts of water vapor into the air in dry areas. It is true that water vapor is more important than CO2, 
But water vapor is something we can't control the amount of because it depends strongly on the temperature. And as the temperature of the atmosphere goes up, uh, the air can hold more water vapor. And in fact, we observe water vapor increasing because the CO2 has warmed the air. So in a sense, it amplifies the effects of CO2. CO2 is the thermostat. We can control that. And when we raise the temperature of the atmosphere, inadvertently, of course, by adding CO2, it makes room for more water vapor, you might say. And so the water vapor amount increases. That's theoretically understandable, and it's observed, and it's in all climate models, too. What happens locally when you uh, irrigate a lot or, or spray a lot of water into the air is you can change the local climate. If you go to Palm Desert on a summer's day when everybody's got their sprinklers running, the local climate is altered. But on a large scale, we're not doing much. Palm Spring is a tiny fraction of the area of the Earth. And if you put too much water vapor into the atmosphere, it simply rains out. And in fact, uh, the atmosphere, you might say, self-controls its water vapor content depending on the temperature. So we don't have a direct handle on that, but we know that water vapor amplifies the effect of, of CO2. It's, it's measured to do that. Dr. Kennel, uh, former director of Scripps, has uh, said we're going to have a certain amount of warming no matter what we do. And uh, we may hold it to two degrees, we may not, but even at two degrees, things change. And what do we know about the two degree world? I think we're learning uh, about the two degree world, but I can say, for example, that in addition to the obvious things, the loss of uh, Arctic uh, uh, seasonal sea ice, for example, we know that at two degrees warming, there are strong uh, influences on food productivity. That is, there are many crops that are sensitive uh, to temperature, and above a very limited range, further increases in temperature decrease the productivity of these crops. So there'll be, uh, in addition, we get water stress, you know. And everything depends really on where you are and what you do. In San Diego, for example, two of the clearest effects are that we will suffer from sea level rise because uh, it'll increase the likelihood of, uh, of beach erosion of the North County cliffs, of saline uh, water flowing into floodplains like Mission Valley. And also, we will suffer in Southern California from water stress because in the warmer world, there'll be less uh, snow for snowpack in the Sierras, our natural reservoir, and the Colorado River is drying up too. So there'll be greater agricultural versus urban, uh, uh, you might say, competition for water, higher water rates, and a lot of dominoes flow from water stress, such as greater wire, wildfire risk. There are a few parts of the world and a few industries that you can think might benefit where, from, say, a longer growing season. But in general, the uh, bads far outweigh the goods. And some of the most sensible analysis that I've seen has been done by the US Department of Defense, which are not a bunch of ideological hotheads. They're very practical, down-to-earth people used to running billion-dollar operations. And they say that uh, a, a warmer world is, is, a, is a world in which threats are multiplied. Uh, you know, the American farmer with high-tech agriculture may cope with changes in the weather in a way that the subsistence farmer in Chad cannot. And so you see a danger of uh, failed and failing states, of environmental refugees, and so on. So there are a lot of dominoes that fall. And, uh, but even at two degrees, um, and it will be, in my view, quite an amazing accomplishment if we're able to limit global warming to that, then there are deleterious effects, and they get worse um, the longer the problem is neglected. Richard, thank you for an excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you all.